So we want to figure out how to get from coloration questions about a knot. You know, how do we assign colors to the arcs in a knot diagram in a way that at each crossing, either all three of the adjacent arcs at that crossing have the same color, or all three are three different colors. Um, how do we get from that to a question that can become about algebra? Like, what does that have to do with algebra? And then from there, how do we get from the algebra of colorations and crossings to a sort of, I like to think of it as a more universal kind of algebra um, that can encode actually in a way all of the information about all the different ways that we could color a knot, not just with three colors or four colors, but actually with arbitrarily many colors. Can we encode all of that information in a single algebraic object that is an invariant for that knot? And the answer is yes, and that invariant is going to be called the Alexander polynomial for that knot. The Alexander polynomial classically was one of the first polynomial invariants that was discovered for knots. And there have been a number that have been discovered since then, uh, including some that are more powerful than the Alexander polynomial. They can tell the difference between more different kinds of knots, um, one of which was the Jones polynomial, for which Vaughn Jones uh, won a Fields Medal uh, at some point. I forget which year he got the Fields. It might have been 2004 or 2000 or something. So it wasn't that long ago. Um, but the Alexander polynomial is kind of the, the grandparent of all of these other polynomial approaches. So we're going back to kind of a classical viewpoint on it today. So two-step process. How do we get from colors to algebra, and then how do we get from algebra to polynomial algebra? So the first step is to figure out how we can make the question about coloration into, a, into an algebra question. And just as a reminder, so a coloration is just a way of assigning to every arc in a knot diagram. So this is a knot diagram up here that has three arcs in it. We assign to each one of those arcs a color, and a coloration is valid if all three colors at each crossing are either the same or all three are different. And it can be a mix and match across the diagram where some crossings have all three the same, other crossings might have all three different, but as long as every crossing is either all the same or all different, then we have a valid coloration. So this coloration is not valid because here's a crossing, for example, that has two arcs that are the same color, but the third arc is different than the other two. That's the one thing we can't do in a valid crossing. Uh, a coloration rather. But if we change colors a couple more times, now we have a coloration that is valid because at all three crossings, one of my conditions is satisfied. In this case, it happens to be all three arcs with different colors at each of my three crossings. So that's where the coloration question begins. And when we first encountered this question, we sort of only gave ourselves three colors to work with. We thought of them as red, green, and blue, right? Um, but what's cool about it is if we want to make this into an algebra question, what we're going to do is not think about colors as things we can see, but colors as things we can compute with. We want to trade out colors for numbers. And that's going to be the first big conceptual shift that we make. So we started out with three colors, but to push the envelope beyond three colors to arbitrarily many colors. Let's say I want to try to color my diagram using a crayon box that has k different colored crayons in it. Right? If I can come up with a k coloration, a way of using all of the crayons in my box of k crayons at least once to color one of the arcs, um, then we will call that diagram k colorable. And again, a coloration is nothing more than a way of assigning, a function which assigns to every arc in my diagram some number, and I'm going to think of the numbers as being 0, 1, 2, up through k minus 1. Right? So there are k different integers that we could assign to the arcs in my diagram. And again, the coloration is valid if every crossing is either a crossing of three arcs of the same color or a crossing of three arcs of all different colors. And the one example of a coloration that always exists for any knot that we want to kind of not care about is the trivial coloration, the one where all the arcs in our diagram have the same color. Every diagram can be colored with all arcs of the same color. So that's the one that we want to kind of ignore when we, when we don't explicitly care about a trivial coloration. What we really care more about are the existences, in some cases, the counting how many different non-trivial k colorations can we make. Um, and again, we also want to kind of insist that a k coloration, we really want to be one that uses all k of the colors. So if you give me eight crayons, but then I only use three of them to color my knot, then probably I don't want to call that an eight coloration. I'd probably rather call that a three coloration. Um, so we also want to, you know, we'd like, we'd like it if this function were an onto function, uh, right? We're using all k of the crayons. All, uh, every, every color is represented in at least one arc of the diagram. So that's what we're going to mean by a k-colorable diagram. 
Um, and we can show that just like tricolorability, k colorability is an invariant of knots, right? It's not a property that, that attaches just to the diagrams, but anytime I make a Reitermeister move to a diagram, if the diagram started out as k colorable, then after any of my Reitermeister moves, it remains k colorable. Um, and so that means that any two diagrams of the same knot are either both going to be k colorable or they're both going to not be k colorable. So we have a knot invariant uh, of which you can watch a video proof on the page if you'd like to um, later on down the line. So here's where the magic happens. Um, and before we get to this magic theorem that's over my shoulder here, um, I feel like it would be nice to, to dig into an example. So let's, let's take off the shelf an example of a knot uh, and we'll try and investigate its colorability properties together. So behind my head here is a knot that goes by the name 818. So it is a knot whose simplest diagram has eight crossings, and we're looking at it right here. Um, and it's the 18th knot in the standard catalog of knots that has eight crossings. Or, uh, right. So it gets called 818. So it has this diagram over here. Um, and so the first question that we might ask is, how do the numbers that we assign to the arcs in a knot diagram tell us something about whether a diagram has the colorability that we want it to have. So how does this become an algebra problem once we trade out colors for numbers instead? So let's imagine that I've assigned to each one of the arcs in this diagram a number that stands in for our colors. So maybe on this under arc right here, I assign a color that I call x. And on the other one of my undercrossing arcs, I assign a color that I call y. And on my overcrossing arc, color that in here, I'll assign a color we'll call z. So one of the ways that we developed when we were talking about rational tangles um, a couple of weeks ago, um, we developed a way to color a rational tangle diagram that was systematic. Remember, we started in the corner of the diagram with a 0 and a 1, and then we worked our way across the diagram, where every time we worked our way across the diagram, we agreed that having the over strand be the average of the two unders. This, that this was a way to guarantee, the keyword being average right here, to guarantee that either all three of those numbers that we assign to the arcs would be the same, because if two of the numbers in an average are the same, then the third one has to be the same as the other two, right? Um, or if two of the numbers where one is an average of the other two, if, two, if any two of them are different, then that means that all three of them have to be different, right? So average is the word that's doing the heavy lifting here. It's what gives this an algebraic reality, right? So if the over is the average of the unders, then we know that either all three are equal or all three are unequal, which is exactly what we want if we're trying to investigate valid colorations. So when we were doing this with rational tangles, um, we started out with the integers 0 and 1. We worked our way across the diagram, and every arc that we colored in with a, a number was colored in with another integer. Sometimes they were positive, sometimes they were negative, but at least they were always guaranteed to be integers, right? But if I, that sort of requires me to have an integer's worth of different colors that I can use for my diagram. If we only have a finite number of colors to work with, on the other hand, let's say I'm investigating tricoloration. If the only colors available to me are 0, 1, and 2, then how am I to understand you know, what's going to happen if, for example, I have an under arc which I've colored 1, and uh, let's say I have a, another under arc which I've colored 0, or something like that. So now what am I supposed to do if I want my overstrand to be the average of my two understrands? Well, the average of 0 and 1 is no longer an integer. Right? The average of 0 and 1 would be 1 half. So it would seem that I'm kind of stuck if I'm trying to get away with just using integers in this case. When in fact, what do we want? If, if this is to be a valid crossing for a coloration, what do we need this overstrand to be colored? We need it to be 2, 
because if those two understands are different, the third one has to be different than the other two, if this is going to be valid, right? So we need a system of arithmetic in which two is actually the average of one and zero, which seems funny. Okay? Um, but it turns out that the arithmetic system that gives us that structure is not the integers, but it's the integers modulo three. Z modulo three, right? Um, so it's the it's the group of integers where the operation is addition mod three. So we add the numbers together and then we take the remainder when the result is divided by three, right? So this these finite cyclic abelian groups, the 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 group of integers modulo k, those are going to be our boxes of crayons for k coloration problems, right? Um, and so in this example, is it true that two is really the average of one and zero? Let's try to investigate this. So if we go back to having X's, Y's and Z's for the moment, then to say, to say that the overstrand is the average of the two understrands is to say that X plus Y divided by two is equal to Z. So let's draw that under here. But division is kind of a dicey thing, right? Because we often, you know, we should be worried whenever we're dividing that the result might not be an integer. So I'd prefer to think of this as a multiplication problem rather than a division problem. So I'll take this two and just multiply it over to the other side of the equation. So x plus y equals two z, right? Um, and just for kicks, let's also move the 2z from the right side of the equation over to the left side of the equation. So I've got a 0 on the right-hand side. x plus y minus 2z is equal to 0. And that was the equation that we worked with over the integers. But if now we're working over the integers modulo 3, we can get away. So I'm going to write mod 3 here at the end of this equation. We can get away with replacing any number that's in this equation with an equivalent number that's equivalent to it, congruent to it, mod 3. And in particular, I want to look at this negative 2 that's right here. What is another number that's sort of simpler on our brains to work with than negative 2 that is equivalent to negative 2, congruent to negative 2, mod 3? What is a simpler way of understanding the number negative 2 in the integers mod 3? So we can replace that negative 2 coefficient in this equation with a positive 1 coefficient because negative 2 and positive 1 are congruent mod 3. And so what we get is this really nice equation. x plus y plus z is equal to 0 mod 3. I like to call this the magic tricolorability equation, right? Um, and we can check that, sure enough, the labeling that we had before, where I had a 1 here, a 0 here, and a 2 there, if I add these three all together, 1 plus 2 plus 0, I get 3. But over the integers mod 3, 3 is indeed congruent to 0. They have the same remainder when we divide it by 3. Namely, the remainder is 0, because 3 is a multiple of 3. And so this equation now does for us, with tricolorability, what the average over is the average of the unders principle did for us when we were coloring with the integers instead. So one way of investigating tricolorability is investigating whether or not we can solve this equation for x, y, and z, where x, y, and z are the colors of the arcs that are involved. Can I solve this equation? at each one of the crossings in my diagram simultaneously. Can this equation be true at every one of the crossings in my diagram? If it can be true at every one of the crossings in my diagram, then I have a way of assigning one of these three colors to each of the arcs in the diagram in a way that the over is the average of the unders, mod 3, i.e., in a way that either at each crossing, at each crossing either all the colors are the same or all the colors are distinct. So coming back to the example of our sort of clovery looking eight crossing knot, what we would do is pick, pick a way of ordering the arcs in our diagram. Um, so we just sort of give all of the arcs names. Um, and by extension, we're also giving names to the colors that we would like to assign to those. So this diagram has eight arcs in it. And so I'll just number them all x1 up through x8. Um, those are going to be the unknowns in my various equations. And then we label each one of the crossings in the diagram. And there's eight crossings in this as well. So I have eight arcs and I have eight crossings. At each one of the crossings, 
we want for this magic tricolor ability equation, this one, we want that equation to be satisfied at each crossing, where the roles of x, y, and z at each crossing are played by the names of the arcs, or equivalently the names of the colors of the arcs that are incident at that crossing. So for example, let me see if I can zoom in on this a little bit. So let's suppose I take, for example, crossing that I've labeled A. And it really doesn't matter, again, how you label your crossings, what order you label them in, what order you label the arcs in. Those are decisions we don't have to sweat um, because it's just like renaming the variables in a linear system of equations or just trading, you know, where are the, which equation is listed first, which equation is listed second in a linear system of equations. None of that matters to the ultimate nature of the solutions to that linear system. So don't sweat how you label the arcs or how you label the crossings. It's what you do at each of those crossings that's important. So for example, at crossing A in this diagram, we're seeing three arcs come together. We have the arc that was labeled X1 as the overstrand, right? and the arcs that are labeled X6 and X7 are the two understrands. And so it turns out that because this magic equation that we're working with here is actually symmetric with respect to any permutation of x, y, and z. We don't have to care actually when we write these equations about which is the over and which are the unders. That's going to change later on. But for tricolorability, tricolorability doesn't care about any of that stuff. It just says when I add all three arcs at my crossing, the sum has to be 0 mod 3. And so at crossing A, we'll get an equation that says that in order for this crossing to have a valid coloration, x1 plus x6 plus x7 has to be congruent to 0, mod 3. Right? And so that's this really nice one equation with three unknowns that it, that equation is satisfied at this crossing if and only if we have a valid coloration at this crossing. And so we run through the diagram and we do that same process for each one of the eight crossings. And as you can imagine, what this gives us is it gives us a system of eight linear equations, one equation for each crossing, in eight unknowns, those unknowns being the colors that we assign to the arcs, right? And if that system of equations, simultaneous system of equations, has a solution, that solution is a valid coloration. If it has no solution, then there is no valid coloration. So we can, what we're doing here is we're dragging linear algebra to the party. Right? And linear algebra is going to have the power to, to tell us whether all of these equations can be simultaneously satisfied, which is what it means to have a valid coloration. So we do that whole process, we get a huge system of eight linear equations and eight unknowns. Um, and, and so you might be thinking, well, the usual strategy for solving a linear system of equations would just be to either use elimination, add or subtract equations from one another to try and eliminate variables and then whittle it down far enough until we get one variable by itself when we can solve for it. Um, or Equivalently, we could just make this into a big 8x8 eight eight matrix, and that 8x8 eight eight matrix in this example, the coefficients in that matrix would all be 1s and zeros. Right? In fact, each row would have three 1s on it, and the rest would be zeros. Uh, and in fact, if you look down here, each column is also going to have only three 1s, and the rest are going to be zeros. So it ends up being a pretty simple 8x8 eight eight matrix, as 8x8 eight eight matrices go. Um, and then we would just have to use the standard tools of linear algebra. Can I find an inverse for this matrix? If I can't find an inverse for this matrix, can I at least row reduce this matrix um, and try and figure out what this solution set looks like? So that's the good news. The bad news is that we are, in fact, never going to be able to find an inverse for this matrix. And the reason we can never actually find an inverse for this matrix, there's the 8 by 8 matrix over there on, on that side, by the way. We can never actually find an inverse because this coloration equation never has a unique solution. There's never only one way to validly color a diagram as long as we have more than one crayon in our crayon box. Because we can always take the same crayon and color the whole diagram the same color. Right? That's always a valid coloration. Even if it's an uninteresting one, don't tell linear algebra that. Linear algebra thinks it's an interesting coloration because it's a solution of this big 8x8 system. So the trivial colorations are always going to be seen as valid by the linear algebra, by this matrix. And because there's always more than one of those, there's never a unique solution to this system. And because there's never a unique solution, this 8x8 eight eight matrix or whatever square matrix that we have here is never going to be invertible. So we're not going to use the inverse of a matrix to do this solution process. Instead, what we want to do is use elementary row operations. 
to eliminate variables and describe the solution set. Um, not only that, the second degree of difficulty um, is that we have to do all of that arithmetic not over the integers, but over the integers mod 3. So as we're doing the elementary row operations, if I want to like subtract this line from this line, right? I'm going to be doing all that subtraction, addition, multiplication. I'm going to be doing all of it in mod 3. So we're going to be casting out all the threes as we go and just working with the remainders, uh, which is also not something we're used to doing when we're solving linear systems, right? Usually we're doing them over the rational numbers. Um, and in a way, it makes the arithmetic simpler because every coefficient is either going to be 0, 1, or 2 uh, at the end of the day. Um, but it's also a ton of work, It'll, you know, sort of cognitive overhead. If we had a ton of time, I might have us do an example by hand. Um, but this is where the technology really comes in and, and saves our bacon. Fortunately, Sage knows how to do linear algebra over finite fields. Uh, in other words, uh, it knows how to do sort of linear algebra mod p, where p is a prime. So we can do linear algebra mod 3 in a Sage cell. We can make a, a matrix, a 3 by 3 matrix of integers mod 3, and ask for the reduced row echelon form uh, of that matrix. So, you know, modifying this Sage cell that's on our, our page is how we can do this. So if I put in the 8 by 8 matrix, which was obtained from this setup from our eight crossing knot. Um, then we just have to ask Sage, what is the echelon form of that matrix? I'll spare you all of the typing uh, because this computation is actually a part of this video. You can see it all here. Do, do, do. And I hope that I scroll down in the video at some point. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So we get the reduced row echelon form of the matrix uh, for, for this sort of coloration problem. And what we want to pay attention to is not, not whether or not there is a solution, because there always is a solution, right? The trivial coloration is always a solution. Um, but what we do is we count how many rows in this matrix don't have non-zero entries. By the time we've done a reduced row echelon form for a square matrix, um, every row that does not have a pivot, I'm using old linear algebra language from your linear algebra days, every row that doesn't have a pivot, which is an entry that's non-zero and everything both to the left of it and underneath it are all zeros. Every row that does not have a pivot corresponds to what's called a free variable. It's a dimension in its solution space. So if I have three rows, as I have in this example, three rows that don't have pivots in them because those rows are all zero in my echelon form, that means there is a whole three-dimensional space where this is a dimension of a vector space over Z mod 3. I have a whole three-dimensional vector space of solutions to this system of equations. And we know one of those dimensions is always going to be taken up by the trivial coloration, right? the one where we color in all the arcs the same. But that means that we have two left over. And so there's two fundamentally distinct ways of assigning colors, 0, 1, and 2, to the arcs in this diagram that is non-trivial and which completely gives us a valid coloration of this diagram. So what we're doing here, and I'll write this on, on the whiteboard real quick. What we're doing is we're counting free variables. How many zero rows or how many non-pivot rows do we have in the echelon form of the matrix that we received? So this is the echelon form uh, for our matrix. And again, the important feature here is that we have three entire rows that don't have pivots in them. So we have a three-dimensional space of solutions. So there are three fundamentally different ways of tri-coloring, well, of validly coloring this diagram. Valid three colorations. And one of them, as I mentioned before, one of them is the trivial coloration. So we're just going to toss one of them out. Uh, and so this means that there are two non-trivial ways. Non-trivial valid three colorations. So in particular, it means that this diagram is three colorable. There is a way of using all three colors to validly color this diagram. In fact, there's two fundamentally different ways of doing that. And so then you might ask, well, that's all well and good, but can this method actually tell me how? Can it actually give us a way of validly try coloring? this diagram? And fortunately, the answer is yeah. Yes, it absolutely can. 
Um, and reaching back again to our linear algebra days, the way to find out how to do that is to take a look at the three variables that don't have pivots in their uh, in their columns. So that would be in this case x6, x7, and x8, the colors of the arcs that we that we labeled the sixth, seventh, and eighth arcs. x6, x7, and x8. Those are what we call our free variables. And they're called free variables because we get to make a free choice of what value that they have. And as soon as we pick values for the free variables, all of the other variables, the bound variables, or sometimes they're called the basic variables, their values is bound to the values that we chose for the free variables. So as soon as we make three choices for the values of x6, x7, and x8 in this example, we can then compute the values of the other ones, x1 up through x5. And when we find that out, it's going to tell us how we can color this diagram. So let's go, let's just make a choice. And I want to make a choice that's going to guarantee that I get a non-trivial coloration, right? So I don't want to pick all three of my free variables to be the same value. If I do that, probably, we can actually check this, I'm going to get a trivial coloration if I set them all equal to zero, for example. Um, so let's not do that. Let's pick one of them to be non-zero. Let's say I pick x6 to be equal to one. And x7, maybe I'll pick it to be zero. And x8, maybe I'll pick it to be zero. So let's say that I make that choice, which I'm free to make because those are free variables. And now I can use those values to determine the values of all of my other variables. So my first equation is x1 plus x6 plus x7 equals 0. And that's to be interpreted as mod 3. Right? But now I've picked values for x6 and x7, 1 and 0, respectively. Right? So I just have to stuff those into this equation. And I'll get an equation that determines x1. x1 plus 1 plus 0 is equal to 0. And when I solve this over mod 3, x1 equals negative 1. But negative 1 is the same thing as positive 2, mod 3. So I'm going to keep track of, uh, of the solutions that we get down here. So x1 is going to be 2. And we'll just go down the list for the other uh, ones of my equations. So this equation is x2 plus x7 plus x8. So 2 plus 7 plus 8 is 0. Again, mod 3. But x7 and x8 are both equal to 0 by our choice. And so x2 plus 0 equals 0. So x2 is 0. So one of the things I'm noticing right away is that we're getting a coloration of this diagram that is going to use all three colors, because we have a 0, a 1, and a 2. So it's actually going to be a tri-coloration. But it's also going to be one of these mix and match colorations, where at some of the crossings, we might get all three different colors. Um, but then there might be other crossings where we get all the same color. I think that might be happening. I'm not completely sure. We won't know maybe until we, um, until we just draw it out. All right, x3. So x3's equation is a little more complicated. x3 plus 2x6 plus 2x7 plus 1x8 is equal to 0. But we picked x7 and x8 to be 0, so we'll just get rid of those terms. x3 plus 2x6 is equal to 0, but x6 we chose to be 1. So x3 plus 2 is equal to 0. When I solve that mod 3, we find out x3 is equal to 1. All right, we just have two more colors to figure out, and then we can go actually color in this diagram. The fourth row, x4 plus 2x6 plus x7 plus 2x8 is equal to 0. Again, because x7 and x8 are both 0, we'll just kill those off. x6 is equal to 1, so x4 plus 2 is equal to 0. So x4 is negative 2, which is otherwise known as positive 1. So x4 is 1. And finally, for x5, x5 plus x6 plus x8 is 0. But x8 we decided was 0. x6 we decided was 1. So x5 is negative 1, which is otherwise known as positive 2. OK. So in order, the colors that we want to do assign to our arcs are 2, 0, 1, 1, 2, 1, 0, 0. 2, 0, 1, 1. 2, 1, 0, 0. So let's go back to the diagram 
uh, for this knot and actually see what that coloration gives us. So let's just color in this diagram and see what this valid coloration looks like and verify that it actually works. So the first arc was zero, so that was a red. Uh, the second arc, no sorry, the first arc was two, it was blue. So we'll put in a blue arc for the first one. Uh, and then it was red after that, so that's arc number two is red. Uh, the third arc was one, so that's green. So over here we'll have a green arc. Uh, and then the fourth arc was also green. And so one thing that we notice here, now that I've drawn in this green arc, we have a crossing right here that has three arcs of different colors, which is good. I have a crossing over here that has two arcs that are the same color, and so that third color there had better be green when we get around to it. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. The fifth arc, X5, uh, is two, and so that should be blue. So I have a blue arc coming around here, which is also good because it makes this crossing right there a crossing of all three different colors. Um, the sixth arc is green, and that reassures us about this crossing here in the middle. All three colors were the same. And then the seventh crossing is red, and the a sorry, the seventh arc is red. So this arc here is red. And then our last arc is red also. Huh. And so there is a coloration. We can check that at each one of the eight crossings, either all three colors are the same, as happens at this crossing, and as happens at that crossing. Um, or all three colors are different, which is what's happening at all the other crossings in this diagram. Um, and we, you know, we had to bring out a pretty big gun of linear algebra to discover this. But what's cool about it is that this is sort of a almost a cookbook way of discovering a coloration, not just proving that one exists, but discovering them and actually sort of, you know, systematically figuring out how we could color in this diagram. Um, so the, you know, the bar for the actual algebra is set fairly high, but it's something we can ask a computer to do, uh, as we did here. Plus, we also have kind of a recipe for finding other colorations as well. Um, we chose, remember, we chose the values of the free variables x6, x7, and x8. That's the colors of this arc, this arc, and that arc. So just by coloring, deciding what to color those three arcs, that determined how the whole rest of the diagram had to have been colored. As soon as I pick those three arcs as colors, and I can pick them to be whatever I want, that determines how to color the rest of the diagram. But that means we could make different choices. If I chose different ways of coloring those three arcs, um, then that could give me different colorations as well. Um, and that there would be a whole two-dimensional vector space over Zmod3 of different colorations means to get a significantly different coloration, one that actually is substantively different, not just up to a rearrangement of the colors, right? Because choosing, for example, uh, as we did here, we chose green, red, red for the colors of those three arcs. It wouldn't really be a different coloration if we chose green, blue, blue instead, right? I mean, that's just a renaming of the colors. It's not, not interesting. But linear algebra tells us that if we instead did, let's say, instead of red, sorry, green, red, red, if we did red, green, red, if we traded a zero with a one, you know, so made this a, a zero, one, zero instead of one, zero, zero, that would be linearly independent over Z mod three. And so that's a part of a separate dimension, right? It's, it's not a linear combination of the other ones. So that's going to give me a fundamentally distinct three coloration if I make that different choice. So this is how tricoloration becomes an algebra problem. And as you might imagine, if we want to investigate k coloration for values of k other than three, all we have to do is set up this same magic averaging equation. Just instead of mod three, we would do it mod k where k is the number of colors that I want to use in my crayon box. But we also lose a little bit of something. We lose the ability to write negative 2 as being the same thing as positive 1. But that's not the end of the world, really, because it just means that if we're not using 3 as our number of crayons, uh, that our matrix that we set up is going to have 1s and some negative 2s in it. Um, and it does mean that if we're not using 3 colors, um, that we have to be careful about which one is the overstrand and which ones are the understrand. So the overstrand is going to be the one that gets the negative twos uh, in each of the equations. And the two understrands are going to have ones. So if you're using a different number of colors, um, each of the rows would have a pair of ones in it for the under arc and a negative two in it for the overcrossing arc. But otherwise, the matrix is set up the same. We can ask Sage to solve it the same way. 
and we can interpret the number of free variables in exactly the same way. One of those free variables is always going to be dedicated to finding the boring trivial solution. But any other free variables that we get are going to be evidence of non-trivial k colorations that we can then use to discover those k colorations if we wish. And because these are not invariants, any difference that we find in the k coloration properties, numbers of free variables, any of that kind of thing, um, let's suppose that I have two knots and one of them, they're both k colorable. But one of them has a two-dimensional vector space of k colorations. The other one only has a one-dimensional vector space of non-trivial k colorations. That's a difference. And because k coloration is a knot invariant, that difference is significant. It means that those must have been different knots. So we're building a really powerful tool. If we come in knowing how many colors we want to try to use, this can tell us whether or not we can color any diagram of that knot using that many colors.